Good afternoon, hello, and welcome to How to Certify Going Beyond the Federation Security Checkbox webinar. If you were looking for today's I Am Online, you are in the right place. This is the monthly webinar series uh, brought to you by Internet2 and In Common that's focused on identity and access management. We're so glad you were able to join us this afternoon. Once again, this is I Am Online for July. And our topic this afternoon is how to certify going beyond the Federation security checkbox. As we get underway, um, I would like to just make you aware of a couple of items. Um, we are recording today's event. It will be posted, the recording, along with the slides um, at the I Am On Le Online website. Uh, and you will also receive the link to the recording and slides via email. So once again, we are recording this afternoon's program. And everyone that has registered for today's webinar will receive uh, an email with the link to both the recording and the slides. We're going to hold our questions until the end of today's uh, presentation. Um, and we will be using the Zoom Q&A function for today's presentation. So we would ask that you use that uh, functionality uh, in uh, posting your questions for today. But you can also feel free to post messages in the chat, but we will uh, primarily be looking to that Zoom Q&A function um, for our questions this afternoon. And once again, we will be recording uh, today's program. Um, having said that, um, without further ado, I'm very happy to turn the virtual podium over to our moderator for this afternoon, David Bantz, uh, who hails from the University of Alaska statewide system and is also chair of the In Common Community Trust and Assurance Board. Take it away, David. Thank you, April, and uh, welcome to I Am Online. Uh, CTAB, which April mentioned, is the governance group within uh, In Common that uh, is responsible for baseline expectations, setting guidelines or um, rules of the road, if you will, to, tr to foster greater assurance between uh, participants in the In Common Federation, all toward the goal of uh, fostering uh, trusted access to resources. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about something that is part of the baseline expectations, CERCFI or certify, as it uh, usually gets pronounced, um, which is a framework for responding to security incidents if they should occur within um, the In Common Federation participants. And uh, to do that, uh, we have the uh, leader of the subgroup uh, uh, chartered by uh, CTAB that has conducted um, uh, tests of use of the certify framework in a kind of tabletop exercise. Um, Kyle Lewis uh, joined CTAB uh, now a couple of years ago, uh, quickly became a very uh, active uh, contributor to the work of CTAB and uh, increasing trust and assurance, and uh, really fostered the idea of having these tabletop exercises and uh, was the leader of them. Uh, Kyle was previously uh, in the U.S. Air Force as a uh, cybersecurity officer, so he comes with a lot of background in um, security and federation. Uh, Kyle's coming to us today from uh, New Jersey, so take it away, Kyle. There we go. Um, so a little funny thing before we start, I was trying to come up with some graphics to to lead this off with. And uh, I was thinking about Federation and how I hear the meme a lot, you know, it's in common, it's kind of like herding cats, it's the coalition of the willing. And I thought, well, what about cats and cybersecurity? And there were no good graphics readily, open source graphics readily available. So I went to Dolly and pulled up some AI images of cat hacker teams defending the network. And uh, I thought it was very interesting. It came back with a 1980s CGI uh, palette. So it's kind of a little ugly, but also a little appropriate. Uh, so I decided to keep it. But uh, we're going to do, we're going to you know, talk about how to certify. And I'm going to say operationalizing certify. So once you're compliant, how do you make it real within your organization? And it involves going beyond the technical. So thank you, David, for that warm uh, welcome. Uh, as uh, he mentioned, uh, my name is Kyle Lewis. I am a member, a member of the Incommon CTAB. And I am the chair of officially what's called the Certified Exercise Planning Working Group, or SEPWG for short. And last year, we ran a cybersecurity cooperation exercise. Um, and that was in order to practice using Certify 
in a distributed tabletop environment, and it involved 10 incumbent member organizations. Uh, some of the feedback called for more training events, opportunities, and more training formats, including a webinar format or presentation format. So uh, this presentation is actually in res direct response to some of those participant uh, feedbacks. And so when talking to other in common members at conferences and various meetings, one of the common themes seems to be that some organizations' connections to in common uh, are through their IAM team. So maybe at the executive level or the CIO level that the organization joined in common, but over time, their IAM teams become the major or sole point of contact to the institution. Uh, and the IAM teams may or may not be integrated uh, or have close relationships with security teams. Now, granted, that's not going to be true for everyone. Uh, my experience is anecdotal to those people that I've talked to, you know, the various tech X's and the, the two iterations of this working group we've had. Uh, but it's a theme, it's a theme that, that's, that's been recurrent enough to take notice uh, as a potential barrier to implementing Certify. And so uh, as we go forward, I want to think of two philosophical goals. How do you plug the IAM team into security? And how do you get the security team injected with more Federation awareness, or what I like to say, federation mindedness. So this is our agenda. We'll start on the surface, on the surface, like what would actually is certify. Uh, and then we'll dive into some practical considerations on how to implement it in such a way that it becomes fully realized in your organization. Uh, so, and we do that because we want the trust goals of the federation's decision to adopt certify as part of basically expectation to also become realized. And we'll wrap up with listing some kinds of situations that might trigger uh, the need for your certified procedures, and then uh, talk about some of the practice, practices and opportunities we plan and offer um, to the Federation. So what is it? it? This is what it stands for, the Security Incident Response Trust Framework for Federator Identity. It's a framework that enables Federation members to coordinate cyber incidents response across, that, that involve more than one Federation member. So, it's a means by which your organization publishes an assertion to the Federation in metadata that you're compliant with this framework, and you also publish your security point of contact so people can reach out to you, and it's available in all, for all the Federation to see. So refeds, oh, uh, one administrative note, you'll see throughout this, this presentation, like at the top here, I have a link to where I'm pulling the source material from. You don't have to worry about trying to copy that down. The very last slide of my presentation has all these links and available for you to screen capture uh, conveniently. Um, but I have them here just so you know I'm, I'm, I'm sourcing these from, from someplace. So Refeds publishes a guide for Federation participants on Certify. Um, and I start, certainly recommend reading it. But in short, to live up to the claims of Certify assertion, what you need to do is you have to self-assess and reach yes on all of the 16, what they call normative assertions, and we'll go into those. And you need to publish a security contact that can receive and respond to security notifications or requests for security help from other members in the Certified Trust Framework. You have to agree to use and honor the traffic light protocol. And then finally, you, you know, you'll, at some point you'll log in or, or someone on your team will log into the Federation portal, portal and they'll check the Certify box so that each of your entity's metadata has the Certify Compliance Assertion. And like I said, well, each of these components we're going to go to go through in a little bit more detail. But going through these things and checking this box, is this enough? Well, no. I mean, if it was, we wouldn't be having this presentation, right? So uh, doing all these things sets the stage, but there are some implied tasks that our organization must do in order to live up to the community trust expectations that this framework is designed to support. Uh, and so... Uh, Trust of questions for self-reflection. So the original version of, of these were framed a little bit more pointed, like, can I trust you to do X, Y, and Z? Um, but I decided to turn these on, this, on their head to be more of a self-reflective tool you know, that, that I could use, that, that each, of, each of you could use you know, in implementing in your organization. So one of the things is, um, you know, if, if, if you reached out to me, and you shared a firewall log and you marked it TLP red, can you trust that my team knows that they can't share it with, with, with anyone else, including they can't share it with me if you didn't send it to me directly? 
Um, or if, if I have a user account that's compromised and has been accessing your systems, can you trust that I'm going to reach out to you and let you know we had a compromised uh, account? Um, and, you know, if I'm uh, going through a security incident um, or you're going through a security incident and you reach out, can you trust that you talking to me is not the first time my team has encountered this framework or no, has encountered, has like not the first time that person who's working in this and has encountered the idea of federation. So those are just some, some kind of questions to frame your mind to help. Like, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper than just, uh, you know, the, the compliance of, of checking the box. And so before we walk through each of the components that certify, I also want to keep what I'm calling two light towers, uh, thoughts in, in our head. Um, what are the events that activate certify? By whom? And then remember, there are two activation points. Uh, there's internally, what, what if your security team discovers an incident that's federation-wide, or externally, you know, your, something comes into your inbox. Uh, and then those are kind of like the beginning points where you start to pull out the threads and your processes and your training. Okay, so now we're going to get to the explicit part of the certified framework, uh, which are the normative assertions. And they're broken into four families. This first one, operational security, it includes things like does your organization do security patching? Do you do intrusion detection? Uh, do you do vulnerability management? Do you do user rights and access management? Um, and this also includes your own internal organic incident response. Do you, do, do you have an incident response capability within your organization? And as you go through self-assessing, hopefully you find out these are already done. So hopefully this is not like a barrier to implementing certified. Um, and and, and the, the, these, these exist on their own. They can pre-exist the, uh, the desire for certify in your organization. The incident response family, on the other hand, is specifically about incident response in the Federation. So in theory, before you're certified compliant, none of these exist. None of these exist. And as you become certified compliant, you have to implement these things. Um, like I said, these are not about your existing procedures. And so by definition, they can't be yes until you've actually implemented them as you join the framework. Uh, but you make sure they're in place so that they become fully realized once you make the assertion. And one note about uh, IR3, um, I have a red asterisk by it, just uh, in case anyone's curious. Um, yes, there is a Certify 2 that has been published and there is a, a it coexists with Certify 1. At this time, Baseline expectations and in common requires certify one. So IR3 is a requirement that was explicitly added in certify two. Um, I would obviously posit that um, the desire and the requirement that if you have a security incident that involves another Federation member um, in certify one, it's implied that you're going to reach out and notify to them. But that was explicitly added to uh, certify two. Okay, and, and uh, the traceability assertions address the ability to review audit logs and trace recorded network activity. So, in other words, it's the ability to investigate an event. And these are crucial in responding to a security incident, including and especially federated security incidents. So if a partner service provider reaches out to you, and let's say you're an identity provider, with evidence that one of your accounts has been compromised, maybe they found some suspicious activity or so, however, um, they do, uh, and and you you have to be able to see where else that account has gone, and you have to be able to uh, so that you can notify any other sort of external service providers that account may have accessed. Obviously, you have other security you know checklists and obligations beyond that. But again, I'm focusing very much on a federation context here. Let's see next, okay. Okay, so finally, in addition to um, the others, we have we have participant responsibilities, and these include like uh, training your users to practice good cyber hygiene. Uh, you have to have a basic sense of user awareness. You know, you don't want them to click on links, and they have to be talked that. Um, and so, hopefully, these are things that exist independent of you uh, going to certify or not. Uh, but if you're asserting certify and you don't have these things, you need to implement those to make sure that these are, are true. Okay. So self-evaluation. So the first step of achieving refits 
uh, certify is to do the self-assessment of everything we just um, you know talked about. And uh, but know that there's some nuance here, and there's some guidance from the refed certify framework uh, in, in the yellow highlights, and you know how thoroughly each is a, how thoroughly the capability exists is not specified. Um, so if a per, if an organization is having problems, you know, answering yes holistically to one of these things, you focus on the components that uh, interact with federation, federated transactions. And there's also a recognition that any kind of risk mitigation or gap uh, is ultimately up to um, the risk determination made within each organization. So you take those into account. But the reality is if you, if you, if you go through any of those questions and you just say, no, we're not doing this, you have to get that to a yes before you can assert, assert uh, certify. And um, I, I consider this part of the, uh, the framework is, is very much behind the scenes or behind the curtain to each organization. Because in the certified trust framework, there's no external audit um, you know, or external check that goes through and grades you on these things. So it is a, um, it, you know, essentially an honor system uh, to make sure you get to yes before you assert certify. Okay. Then we get to the security contact. So this, this gets back to uh, how integrated are your IAM and security teams? And so if there's a cert request of should I have five event and it goes to your security team, and they're not familiar with Federation, how well is it going to be handled? And I think there's been, there might be an unconscious assumption on some people's parts that you have to put your organizational security team as your security contact. But getting back to the certified, the refeds wiki, um, and again, this link will be included in the last slide, uh, they have published a, a kind of a decision chart to help guide you through what or who should you be um, publishing and sharing as a security contact. Uh, and, and, and again, the idea here is the people answering the phone, so to speak, um, need to understand what certify is. They need to know how to, to uh, honor five plate protocol, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I do want to caveat this thing, and we'll talk about this uh, as we go forward. Even if you don't make your, your main security team your, certif your security contact, you still have to make sure that your security team understands, certify, and, no and you get that federation mindedness injected into their procedures. Because if they detect something and investigate something, they have to think about that dimension. Otherwise, it's going to be missed. Okay, and so the, the third part is the traffic light protocol. Uh, provides a way, basically, if you're going to share some sensitive information, maybe it's a network log, a firewall log, uh, that you know you want, you're cooperating with your with the other organization's um, investigation team, but it's sensitive. Uh, it's a way for you to indicate what your expectations are on them and how far, if at all, they can share what you provided them. And uh, you know, this may include an account, the identity of an account that was compromised, uh, like the username, uh, or all the way up to sharing audit logs. So this slide here shows kind of like the thumbnail versions of the definitions. There's a little bit more detail and caveats and nuances like TLP clear, TLP wipe. Its disclosure is not limited, but of course that has nothing to do with copyright law. So you can't, if, you're, if there's copyrighted material, um, that, that's actually specified in the TLP definitions if you go to uh, CISA.gov. Um, but I expect in these kinds of scenarios, the default will be, unless, you know, exceptions notwithstanding, uh, TLP AMBER is probably going to be uh, the norm uh, when, when you're working through a cybersecurity scenario. And so this gets also back to, we talked about who's answering the phone, who's the security team, are they trained on the traffic light protocol? And so the reason I foot stomp this, I think in a trust federation, ensuring that your own teams know how to honor this, it's as or more important than knowing how to mark your own information. Because vice versa, you, if you mark it, you want to be confident that um, the partner organizations are honoring your wishes. They understand that they understand what your wishes are. Okay, so to make certify real within your organization, it's almost certainly going to require an evolution of your culture and your processes. To build federation mindedness, 
your main securities team's procedures need to incorporate a federation response and they need to practice it at least as an internal exercise or an internal training. My, my preferred method is tabletop exercise, but there is more than one way to achieve training. So your IAM team needs to realize that they are part of your organization's security framework if they don't already. And again, I, you know, I know there are a lot of organizations that, that do have this, but um, it's good to stop and think about that. And if there is not a strong institutional relationship between your security team and your IAM team, I would posit that your IAM team, since this is probably the, the biggest audience that most of the audience here are IAM uh, teams, need to reach out and establish a routine and a recurring touch point because you're probably going to have to help them update their procedures. So getting back to the light towers. Um, I alluded to these earlier on, and now that we've talked about certified components, these points should be more crystallized signposts on what you, where you need to start and what you need to do, uh, documenting your procedures uh, and training on them. So, you know, what activates certify? So where does the process kick off? There's two ways, two kind of discovery points. It's either internal or external. Um, who's responsible for it and are they trained? Uh, and and so all, are all these consider, considerations documented? So this is what we did uh, on the, you know, I, I, what, so one of my other jobs is I worked for the NIAD International Biomedical Support Team. And so way back when, when uh, in common was about to make it part of baseline expectations, uh, my boss, who, who some of you know, Chris Whalen, came to me and my colleague and was like, hey, we have to be certified compliant. What does that mean and what does it take? And so on the technical side, it was just you know, a matter of where do we publish the metadata? Who do we want our security contact to be? We did some things behind the scenes. We created a security email that you know, generates into our ticketing system and made sure that the ticket was high priority and we were all notified. Uh, but beyond that, um, we wrote a standing operating procedure on certify, which includes all the certify components. Um, it includes um, you know, internal requirements like, okay, we got this request. How do we make sure it's legitimate? Uh, before we share any information, even though, you know, organizationally, we're going to, we're going to help them cooperate because we're part of the framework. Um, we probably want to notify our leadership. You know, our CIO is probably going to be, want to be, be or and our CISO will probably want to know pretty quickly if there's a potential security incident um, that's affecting us or that, that we might be affecting other, someone else. Uh, so we have some internal things we had to consider. Uh, we, we wrote down the guidance on the TLPs. So, and, and we put all of this into our internal information management library. So as part of our larger body of IT support and security documentation. So it was seamlessly integrated. Uh, and then, of course, we created a training session. So there's a slide deck on speaking notes that went along with the introduction of the SOP. And then we already had a annual requirement. Uh, to practice our security incident response plan because NIAD obviously is a U.S. government client and the government has these, you know, the, through NIST, it has these requirements to have response plans and, and practice it once a year. Uh, and so we went through those checklists and we started asking, adding triggering questions. So every single time there's a security incident, we, we systematically go through each point in the checklist. We don't rush it and we go, we get to the question that says, is, does this involve a federated account or is this one of our accounts that's linked to our IDP so it has federated access? And if the answer to that is yes, it directs us to open up the SOP. And, uh, and then we incorporated that into our tabletop, internal tabletop exercises. And then we added training on the, the ReFeds metadata extraction tool, or sorry, metadata explorer tool, which I'll show here in a future slide. Uh, on how to look up security context. So this gets back to, are your people trained on what they need to do? Most of certify is a process and procedure thing, but there are a couple actions they need to know how to do. Like if they get uh, the entity ID, how do they go find that security contact? Uh, and then we also included quizzes on TLP markings. So if you feel like you have to start from scratch, you don't have to start from scratch. And so I don't intend to go into all of these points here. These are screenshots, but I wanted to show you that this is available. Um, Edugain uh, has a security incident response handbook. Uh, and 
um, on the, the certify uh, wiki, um, it has a section for federation, at least to this, and it has a section for federation participants. So these are things you can use to incorporate in your own documentation. Um, so that's one resource. We also have on, this, on the, the, the certify wiki, uh, a bunch of templated emails. So incident response templates, these aren't mandatory. Uh, but these are available for you to use as a starting point to supplement your local procedures. And we share these uh, templates with um, all, the, all the, the teams that decide to play in our, our tabletop annual tabletop exercise that we host for Uncommon. And then finally, this is the, the, uh, the MET tool, the metadata, metadata extraction tool. And so this is a tool where you can put an entity ID and it returns the Federation metadata, including the published contacts. And we demo this for all our exercise participants as part of the, the exercise training. Uh, and we, we design the exercise so that all the players actually use this because they start passing, they have to find that security contact to be able to pass traffic, pass messages to each other. Uh, and so your security response training needs to incorporate this tool uh, and also you know, we talked earlier about the traceability controls, the ability to look in your audit logs. Those are important because that's where you're going to find the seeds to this. You're going to find those entity IDs that you plug into this tool that then gives you uh, the email address for the security contact. And then finally, uh, the Refeds Incident Response Handbook also talks about working with your federation operators. So there's another number of federation operator responsibilities. And in, in common, there is a published security incident response contact. So I kind of showed you the Uncommon website here. Uh, you go to help, and then you go to security incident response, and it takes you to this other page, and there's an uh, email address with a PGP key. If you, um, if you support PGP, you can send secure notes, and the, or there's a voicemail. Um, and then you can use that to notify them uh, when there's an incident that affects the Federation. And it, this, this is important because they might help you, uh, you know, let's say, in common, part of a federation of federations edu game, right? And so maybe the incident spills over into an international partner that's not part of income. And, um, you know, the federation operators can help make those linkages with the edu game. Okay. And then obviously, that, you know, when you're thinking about security incidents, what kinds of things might trigger the need for the certified procedure? And these are ideas you could use in your own internal uh, exercises. Um, you know, obviously, if, if something gets compromised, a server gets comp compromised to be a sp spam server and it starts using an address, um, it could be that email address could be coming from an account that's also, uh, you know, has federated access. Um, the big one, of course, is a user account is you discover someone's been phished. That's probably one of the biggest risks to a network is the, the, the social, social engineering. Uh, now, there might be instances where there's a hacktivist group out after account get out of that, excuse me after account credentials because they want to go scrape some research libraries that have you know research papers that aren't necessarily you know, open to the public without being a member and they publish it on an underground server. Um, nation state actors are always a factor. Um, you know, research and education, everyone's interested in getting competitive edge. And at least in the NIH and the NIAID world during COVID, you know, it, it hit the news, you know, if, if you guys didn't see it, but um, there were definitely nation state actors, China, Russia, uh, trying to get at COVID research. Um, so insider threat, I'm not going to read all of these, but insider threat is always uh, an issue. Uh, or maybe you have a user come to your help desk and say, hey, uh, I had an identity monitoring service. They told me my credentials were found on the web, and it happens to be my institutional credentials. But the bottom line here is, it doesn't matter how this starts. Anytime you have an indicator of a compromised account, your security team needs to ask, does this account access the Federation? And then the next question is, during that time frame that we think this account was compromised, did this account access an external SP in the Federation? And that's when we're you know, in my, in my view, we're obligated to then exercise our certified procedures because we're all trusting each other to do this, to do the same. So these are some recommended areas to include, include in your own internal documentation or standard operating procedures. And the highlighter yellow items are things that, you know, you can practice in an internal tabletop exercise. 
And these also happen to be the training goals of the uncommon, what I, what I call the cybersecurity cooperation exercises. And we did the first one last year. And these, these tasks include looking up security contacts, how to respond to requests for help. You know, and like I said, we have some internal things we had to practice. I, I have a request for help. I'm not just going to respond. I need to, to notify leadership and, and, and there's some notifications that we have to make internally before we move forward on that. Um, you know, and of course, knowledge of the TLP levels. Uh, for the bottom bullet point, though, uh, it's important to add certified questions to all response actions for compromised accounts. Security teams need to be prompted to ask if the account has access to other service providers. And I know I've been saying that repeat, re, uh, over and over again, uh, but I also believe you know repetition helps things sink in. So to review the practical points, do your self-assessments, update your security checklists, train your teams on certify responsibilities and actions, train on the traffic light protocol, and train on how to find a security point of contact. And then it's important to practice. And speaking of practice, last year, we sponsored our first cybersecurity cooperation exercise. We had 10 organizations participate in a distributed week-long scenario. And what did that consist of? Well, our planning group focused on specific objectives to prompt processing procedures. It was not a technical exercise. There was no real-world network activity or clues being buried in a real audit log that someone had to go find. It's fairly straightforward, but each participating organization, they got to practice responding to and notifying um, other playing organizations. And each organization had an opportunity to review their own holistic internal security procedures. And they used the opportunity to train and develop their teams. Each organization learned how to look up security metadata, something that we found that without training, uh, folks assumed it would just be easy to do, but people didn't necessarily know how to do it. The answer is it is easy to do if you know how to do it. But if you don't know how to do it, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And you can lose time uh, trying to figure that out. And then, and then this exercise last year in 2022, the feedback from the participants was consistently a desire to do more such events and to expand on the training opportunities. And so if you weren't there that last year, this is how it looked like. So I said it was a week long. Really, it was um, an orientation on Monday for the players, three days worth of script, and then a wrap up, lessons learned. We all came back together and talked about the event. And the impact on each organization was, you know, a few hours on a given day. It wasn't each organization was playing, excuse me, through all three days. So what are we doing this year in our working group? So it's, uh, you know, it's obviously this, this uh, webinar on what are those extra process and procedure things we need to consider before we can say, yeah, we're living up to the trust expectations uh, of Certify and our, our friends in the Federation. Uh, there is an open survey to the community. It's still open. Uh, this link is, um, again, included in the final slide. But it asks things like, of Certify, like, what areas would you like to focus on? And then it also asks things of, how would your organization like to learn? Like, is it the exercise? Is it a seminar? Is it a, a one-day combined table talk? Like we could do something in a Zoom room all at once with everyone where we talk through things. All of those are, are possibilities. Um, and uh, what we have done is we've evolved the narrative script. Uh, and what we're doing for practice this year is a fictional internal to our own team. We're gonna practice like how to run an exercise on one August. And that's something just for our working group. Uh, and that gets us ready for the November exercise. But that script that we developed to practice internally will be something that we'll be able to pass on next year that if, you know, there could be uh, a, a one or two, probably two, two or three hour session, maybe at a, at a conference or a Zoom, uh, you know, combined Zoom call where we did like an in-person cooperative tabletop. And for this year's November exercise, um, the call for participation will go out uh, likely mid to late August, it will be open through the end of December, oh, sorry, open through the end of September. So I want to keep that open until after TechX. Uh, but the targeted dates for that week-long exercise this year is November 13th or 17th, which is the last full week before the Thanksgiving week. And just to show you an example of the narrative richness, um, last year we didn't need to storyboard the script. So this is actually the storyboard we're using internally for our practice 
uh, on one August with our working group to learn how to do this. And we, we, we used this approach to kind of throw out the script. We wanted to come up with a, with a scenario where there were two separate hacker organizations with two different agendas, but because of federation, you know, the response gets a little bifurcated and uh, we color coded it. So we had a blue scenario and a purple scenario, and then we put, you know, the, the and these are fictional organizations, but when we play, plan for November, it'll be the organizations that want to participate. Uh, and we can color code it and see, okay, where's the distribution of activity uh, with each, each of the playing organizations. So for us, this is a learning experience, but I think every year we do this, we're going to have a group of people on the planning committee, and then we, we're going to spend some time forming as a group to learn how to do this. And, and that's also you know, another benefit to being on the SCP. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but you know, next year we'll do this again. Um, great to have some volunteers. And I think that's another benefit is anyone who's on this team will be able to take some of these methods on how do you build a scenario and how do you practice and bring it back to your own organizations. And so these are the conclusions and the takeaways. Um, so it's everything I just talked about. Uh, but think about your procedures and your checklist behind the scenes uh, and not, you know, what does it mean when you're saying, I'm going to do this? How do you make sure you're actually going to do this? And that comes to procedure process training. And then please uh, consider, look for the call for participation that's kind of that's going to go out for the exercise this year. And um, if you're interested, consider vol volunteering for next year's SCPWG. If you come to TechX this year in September, I will be there. I'm happy to talk about any of this in more detail. And this is my final slide. So available for you to snapshot and capture to your heart's content. And at that point, I think I am finished and ready to turn over back to uh, David and Yoko. Thank you, Kyle. That was a very broad and uh, simultaneously in-depth uh, exploration of the exercise and why we want to repeat that exercise and make sure we're able to respond and uh, clear incidents. Um, I believe we're open for uh, questions uh for kyle anyone uh the attendees i think you can uh either raise your hand in chat or uh type a message in the uh, chat raise your hand in the attendees list uh, kyle, you mentioned oh, go ahead yeah, I was just going to help. This is April. Uh, we actually do have a question that came in through the Zoom Q&A. This is from Aaron Scanlon. How are trust violations reported and handled? So I'm going to turn it over to David, but I think I'm going to parrot the question so I under make sure we're understanding it. I think what you're asking, for example, is, you know, what happens if someone doesn't honor your TL, does not honor your TLP marking? What happens if does, someone does not live up to um, what they say the assertions are be. Um, and so to me, there's nothing in certified that directly addresses that. However, it being part of baseline expectations within common has uh, an additional factor for consideration. And at that, I think I might turn over to David. Mm. So one of the responsibilities of CTAB, the Community Trust and Assurance Board, is to play a role when there's a conflict or a dispute among participants. So if there is a participant that appears not to be appropriately responding and clearing uh, security incidents, that could result in the other participants saying, wait a minute, we've got a problem. We need to have this other participant either step up and respond or in some way, you know, ultimately have them perhaps removed from the, the Federation, which would be the final step of, a, of an entire process. So to facilitate that potential of a conflict and a way to resolve it, there is an elaborate process called the uh, dispute resolution process, which focuses, first of all, in trying to get enough communication going so that people will in fact address the issue and only as a last result suggest some kind of punitive action like removing an entity from the uh, incoming federation which would go through a, an entire checklist of community consensus and consultation and 
inability of the uh, participant to respond. We have not had anything go through that full process in the several years that it's been in place. Well, that's a good thing. We have had entities that were unable or unwilling or did not respond to some of the other baseline expectations. And a small number of them were in the end uh, cooperatively removed from the Incoming Federation. Those entities aren't there. So there is some teeth expectations. Kyle, you mentioned a couple of times in the uh, presentation, uh, re retrieving contact, security contact metadata uh, from the refeds tool. Um, I think you have the ability to actually demo that live. You might want, if, if, if you'd like to. Yeah, we can do that. Um, let's see. Make sure I get my Right page up, of course, I'll have that page loaded just in case. Go back to sharing my screen. So this is the live page. Um, I'm going to take our entity ID that you would. So if you were, you know, if if, if uh, we were told one of our accounts were compromised, or actually if you're, you're a service provider and you suspect our account was compromised, it was doing something weird, and you're, you look in your your shibboleth logs um, or, or whatever tool you're using, um, you would find the entity ID. And one of the keys here, so you have this metadata explorer tool and it's hosted by Edugame. So it's a federation of federations. It includes in common and others, everyone in Edugame. And um, you do not have to click this login link up here, access through your institution. I know some people got caught up on clicking on that, and for whatever reason, they couldn't get in, so they thought the site was broken. The site's not broken. You don't have to log in. You just go into the service ID. You put in that entity ID that you would get from your logs, and it pulls, see, this is our IDP. It pulls it right up and shows what federations they're in, and then to get the security thing, security contact, all you need to do is then click on the name that comes up, pulls up all the metadata, and on this tool, it's not marked security, it's marked other. So under contacts at the very bottom, it's marked other. And if I highlight over that, you'll see there's a mail to global security at niad.nih.gov, and that's my security contact. You can also find, like if, if for whatever reason you wanna go out and find something, maybe you don't have an entity ID, but uh, let's look at that one. You can actually search on, and you know names too. So this is everything that comes up with Molly. I know I'm, I I serve Molly, but if you were looking for some Molly ran an event management system, um, you could find something that way. And then you could do the same thing. You click on. Uh, so, so they're in in common. Let's see if they have. Uh, so it does not look like this entity ID has a a uh, security contact. Denoted. Well, the certify requirement is a requirement for in common members, not necessarily for other federations. Right. 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 That's a good point. So that's it's it's not a hard tool to use. Um, the challenge is if you don't have internet access, it's hard to get to it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's 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 one of those things that once you see it, it's easy. But if you don't know about it and you don't know how to look it up, um, or you get stuck on clicking on this login thing that may not work for whatever reason, uh, it, it, it hampers you up, but all you gotta do is put in the entry guide here and you pull up the, pull up the uh, security contact. So we have another question in the Q&A um, asking whether there are any monetary resources available, grants or other forms uh, for training with Certify. That's that I don't know. Alley. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else would be welcome to uh, contribute if you know of such a source. Hey, that's beyond my scope of awareness. So that's why I'm trying to offer or help help participate and facilitate things that are openly available.
Uh, this is April again, and Kyle, I did put in chat if you want, I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little um, more about the survey that you all have going, because I think one of the goals there was to find out what kinds of training people were interested in, um, so that we have that sense, you know, whether or not that that's, um, um, you know, training that, um, you know, we're able to provide in the, the future. Right, so the survey has a series of questions such as, you know, is this least important, most important, so you get typical get to grade your interest level. Um, it asks things like, uh, what's going to be most beneficial to your organization? You know, lectures, um, a blog post, uh, an in-person exercise, or, you know, virtual Zoom call where it's all at once, uh, training materials, uh, the distributed exercise, the tabletop that, I've, that, I, that we're building. Uh, and then um, it also asks things like, where do you need the most focus? Is it TLP? Is it what kinds of scenarios would trigger certify? Um, is it um, help on the norm of assertions, you know, those kinds of things. And it's a, this link takes you to a Google form. Uh, it does, from my understanding, require a Google account to access. I have explicitly said it that it does not record your email address. So if all you have is a personal Google Gmail account, you can still get into it, fill it out for your organization. It's not going to give us your personal email account. Uh, it asks you to enter in one of the fields, what is your point of contact email? So Kyle, I, I don't know if you uh, are far enough along in the process yet, but I, I wonder if there are particular kinds of either expertise or interests among participants that you're looking for, or a type of institution or organization to participate in the next exercise. Is your opportunity to recruit? We, so we don't have... To me, a breadth is more important than targeting specific things. Um, we want a mix, obviously, a mix of service providers and identity providers. Um, a balanced mix would be ideal, but we'll work with whatever we can get. Um, it would be nice to have a representation from big universities, community colleges, government. Um, to, to me, diversity is, is the key there. Um, but I can't think of like, What we will be asking this year, which we didn't really last year, is you know for service providers, a little bit of information on like what service is this, what does this do? Because we're going to try to tailor the script a little bit to what your service actually provides. Um, I'm hoping. Well, I don't want to give away too much, but but I'm hoping uh, we get a library. You know, one of the service providers is maybe a technical library that, that hosts research papers. Um, but obviously, databases, any kind of research database, uh, makes the script easy. But I would also say, just participate. If all we get are IDPs, we'll, we'll figure something out. I'll role play a service provider if I have to. <laughs> but I don't think that's really, really a danger. We got a good, good, healthy mix last year. We had, actually, it, it ended up being equal distributions. We had, in each playing team, we had six service provider entities and six, sorry, three and three, three and three IDPs that we were able to weave together. There's a question here. Would sharing the full NIAID SOP and letting folks review it help orgs determine what resources they might already have and might need to procure? Now you can elaborate, you can uh, speak if you want to elaborate on that, Aaron. Uh, it really just kind of looked like the uh, pillow, by the way. Excellent talk. Um, it really just kind of looked like the um, NIAID uh, AID one was kind of like a high level uh, sort of discussion of you know, the SOP that was generated with them. I'm wondering, obviously, some parts of that SOP might need to be, you know, uh, retconned or, or whatever to protect organizational context. But, uh, you know, the I, I liked the uh, example of, you know, an organization saying, well, how do I even get started with this? And I feel like if, you know, I, again, I think that high level um, um, outline was was solid, but I was just thinking, uh, what what are the things could be offered to organizations that are really, you know, kind of starting from square zero, or at least think they're starting from square zero, right? I think it's very important to consider whether or not an organization might already have uh, some of the tools and resources that they need to get going with this, uh, but might just need help recognizing that. Right. Um, I don't. I probably wouldn't share like this this straight SOP as we've written it. It's but it's going to be easy to tailor. 
But the, I've written these slides in a very outline and checklist format for a reason, so that anyone, and including our own working group, you know, maybe that's work after we get past this next exercise for, for next year, to take that and turn it into an implementation handbook. Um, you know, these are the go through a checklist of these are the things you need to address. Here's an example procedure, but it's hard to write a single procedure for every organization because like your organization is not going to look like mine and vice versa. Um, I, I'm on I'm on a team that's much more homogenous in that our international team has. Um, in fact, I meant to I meant to caveat that as I said, we did all this training. Uh, we are separate from the NIAD uh, main security team. Um, and the NIAD main security team and its certified responsibilities actually falls under NIH. It's, it's a weird scenario. So we have our own security front door and our team has IAM, um, all these system administration and, and security on one team attending the same daily standups every day and, and, and all involved. So we're, our disciplines are tightly integrated from that standpoint. And I know some universities, it's like, yeah, it's one quote unquote organization, but it's really a campus of campuses. And there's a lot of, maybe even a lot of different CIOs and it's, it's, it's much more non-homogenous environment. And I don't, like this, this one person here doesn't necessarily have the answer to solve all that because I don't know what your organizations are, but that's where having more representation on these, these SEPWGs, like I would love to see this offered every year and to get better and better every year. And the more, diversity and breadth of experience and kinds of organizations that are represented in these training, training scenarios will just add richness and value every year. And, and I agree. think coming up with like a, like, just like, just like Edugain had those, those email templates to start with. Like, if you don't know how to reach out to someone, here's something you can tailor. Here's some procedures you can tailor. Um, and I can share like our, our, our incident response checklist, you know, it's, pretty high level. It's not like go press this button and pull this lever, you know, and deploy the script. It's are you do you have the right people in the room? And during the investigation phase, there's a specific question you have to answer it is 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 this in response to a request for help? Is this coming from outside from the federation or is this account that we're worried about? Cuz not all of our accounts are federated accounts even on the international team. Um, but is this account attached to RDP and then it's like, oh, it is. We have to like go down this branch now. That all definitely makes sense. Thank you very much for that. No, thanks. For, thanks for the questions. Appreciate it. So, Kyle, um, when you were discussing the traffic light protocol, you emphasized, of course, if something has got a red, you're not going to be able to share that. But the same list of requirements also mentioned notifying the contacts of other entities that might be implicated in a security incident. Talk a little bit more about how those two requirements. Right. So if you, if you encounter a collision, that's not a, I like to call that a bureaucratic collision. Um, all of the TLPs have exceptions and caveats. You can always go back and ask for, okay, I can't do anything with this unless you allow me to share X, Y, and Z. And I would imagine from my perspective, there's not so I'm gonna. From my, there's not much that I would want to mark TLP red. The only time on my team that I would recommend marking a TLP red would be something that would have CNN level implications. Um, and the example I like to use in training, as you know, our 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 director until very recently was Dr. Fauci, and Dr. Fauci was obviously in the news very often. So if we had an incident where we had a compromised user account, I might mark TLP amber. Every, all the network stuff that we're trying to solve the account with. But if it comes out whose account it was, I might just pick up the phone and say, hey, TLP Red, this is why I'm not telling you and sending you in the email whose it was about. Because if that got out to the, to the news, that would just go boom. So for us, those are the kinds of sensitivities we might consider. If someone were to come to my team and say, okay, I'm going to send you a firewall log and I'm marking it TLP Red, the first thing I'm going to tell that person is like, well, I'm not my firewall, I'm not my technical expert. So I'm not gonna be able to do anything with this. You're gonna to have to let me share it or get someone else in the room, right? And TLP Red, if you read the CISA guidance, it says it's mostly intended for phone conversations. Um, it's, it's one of those things like, 
if you tell me TLP red, I can't even tell my boss what you told me. I can tell, might be able to tell my boss, you told me something and we got to do something, but I can't give the details. And so to me, TLP red is not very useful in solving the scenario, hopefully. So you can get, so there has to be that conversation back and forth of what do I need to help you? And I need you to listen this up to Amber if you want me to be able to help you kind of thing. I think there's always going to be like that human interaction that has to negotiate those collisions. Well, it's five minutes before the hour. I have a practice when I um, chair our CTAB meetings of trying to end a few minutes before the top of the hour to give people a break before their next in <laughs> on site or online meeting. So uh, pause just for a second. If there's any last question or uh, comment for the good of the order, April, do you have a closing remark for I am uh, yes. online? Yes, I do. Thank you so much, David. Um, and many thanks to uh, both you and Kyle for a great presentation and discussion um, this afternoon. And to everybody who attended, um, whether you posted questions or just listened in, uh, we very much appreciate you being with us this afternoon. And special thanks to Courtney and the Internet Two Meetings team who make I Am Online possible every month. Uh, before we sign off, I do want to let you know that, the, again, we did uh, record this event, so that recording will be available to you. There is a quick four-question survey that you'll get as you're exiting, exiting Zoom. We'd ask that you complete that. We appreciate your feedback about I Am Online. Also want to let you know we are taking August off, so we will be back in September with another great webinar for you. Um, once again, thank you for being here. We'll see you in September. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye, all. -bye. Bye,